Projective geometry is a topic of mathematics. It is the study of geometric properties that are invariant with respect to projective transformations. This means that, compared to elementary geometry, projective geometry has a different setting, projective space, and a selective set of basic geometric concepts. The basic intuitions are that projective space has more points than Euclidean space for a given dimension and that geometric transformations are permitted that transform the extra points to Euclidean points, and vice versa. Properties meaningful for projective geometry are respected by this new idea of transformation, which is more radical in its effects than expressible by a transformation matrix and translations. The first issue for geometers is what kind of geometry is adequate for a novel situation. It is not possible to refer to angles in projective geometry as it is in Euclidean geometry, because angle is an example of a concept not invariant with respect to projective transformations, as is seen in perspective drawing. One source for projective geometry was indeed the theory of perspective. Another difference from elementary geometry is the way in which parallel lines can be said to meet in a point at infinity. Once the concept is translated into projective geometry's terms, again this notion has an intuitive basis, such as railway tracks meeting at the horizon in a perspective drawing. See projective plane for the basics of projective geometry in two dimensions. While the ideas were available earlier, projective geometry was mainly a development of the 19th century. This included the theory of complex projective space, the coordinates used being complex numbers. Several major types of more abstract mathematics were based on projective geometry. It was also a subject with a large number of practitioners for its own sake, as synthetic geometry. Another topic that developed from axiomatic studies of projective geometry is finite geometry. The topic of projective geometry is itself now divided into many research subtopics, two examples of which are projective algebraic geometry and projective differential geometry. Overview. Projective geometry is an elementary non-metrical form of geometry, meaning that it is not based on a concept of distance. In two dimensions it begins with the study of configurations of points and lines. That there is indeed some geometric interest in this sparse setting was seen as projective geometry was developed by Disargues and others in their exploration of the principles of perspective art. In higher dimensional spaces there are considered hyperplanes, and other linear subspaces, which exhibit the principle of duality. The simplest illustration of duality is in the projective plane, where the statements, two distinct points determine a unique line, and two distinct lines determine a unique point, show the same structure as propositions. Projective geometry can also be seen as a geometry of constructions with a straight edge alone. Since projective geometry excludes compass constructions, there are no circles, no angles, no measurements, no parallels, and no concept of intermediacy. It was realized that the theorems that do apply to projective geometry are simpler statements. For example the different conic sections are all equivalent in projective geometry, and some theorems about circles can be considered as special cases of these general theorems. During the early 19th century the work of Jean-Victor Poncelet, Lazare Carnot and others established projective geometry as an independent field of mathematics. Its rigorous foundations were addressed by Carl von Stout and perfected by Italians Giuseppe Pino, Mario Pieri, Alessandro Padoa and Gino Fano during the late 19th century. Projective geometry, like affine and Euclidean geometry, can also be developed from the Erlangen program of Felix Klein. Projective geometry is characterized by invariance under transformations of the projective group. After much work on the very large number of theorems in the subject, therefore, the basics of projective geometry became understood. The incidence structure and the cross-ratio are fundamental invariants under projective transformations. 
Projective geometry can be modeled by the affine plane plus a line at infinity, and then treating that line as ordinary. An algebraic model for doing projective geometry in the style of analytic geometry is given by homogeneous coordinates. On the other hand axiomatic studies revealed the existence of non-Disargasian planes. Examples to show that the axioms of incidence can be modeled by structures not accessible to reasoning through homogeneous coordinate systems, in a foundational sense. Projective geometry and ordered geometry are elementary since they involve a minimum of axioms and either can be used as the foundation for affine and Euclidean geometry. Projective geometry is not ordered, and so it is a distinct foundation for geometry. History The first geometrical properties of a projective nature were discovered during the 3rd century by Pappus of Alexandria. Filippo Brunelli she started investigating the geometry of perspective during 1425. Johannes Kepler and Gerard de Sargues independently developed the concept of the point at infinity. De Sargues developed an alternative way of constructing perspective drawings by generalizing the use of vanishing points to include the case when these are infinitely far away. He made Euclidean geometry, where parallel lines are truly parallel, into a special case of an all-encompassing geometric system. Desargues's study on conic sections drew the attention of 16-year-old Blaise Pascal and helped him formulate Pascal's theorem. The works of Gaspard Monge at the end of 18th and beginning of 19th century were important for the subsequent development of projective geometry. The work of de Sargues was ignored until Michel Cazals chanced upon a handwritten copy during 1845. Meanwhile, John Victor Poncelet had published the foundational treatise on projective geometry during 1822. The non-Euclidean geometries discovered soon thereafter were eventually demonstrated to have models, such as the Klein model of hyperbolic space, relating to projective geometry. This early 19th century projective geometry was intermediate from analytic geometry to algebraic geometry. When treated in terms of homogeneous coordinates, projective geometry seems like an extension or technical improvement of the use of coordinates to reduce geometric problems to algebra, an extension reducing the number of special cases. The detailed study of quadrics and their line geometry of Julius Plucker still form a rich set of examples for geometers working with more general concepts. The work of Poncelet, Jacob Steiner and others was not intended to extend analytic geometry. Techniques were supposed to be synthetic. In effect projective space as now understood was to be introduced axiomatically. As a result, reformulating early work in projective geometry so that it satisfies current standards of rigor can be somewhat difficult. Even in the case of the projective plane alone, the axiomatic approach can result in models not describable via linear algebra. This period in geometry was overtaken by research on the general algebraic curve by Klesch, Riemann, Max Noether and others, which stretched existing techniques, and then by invariant theory, towards the end of the century. The Italian school of algebraic geometry broke out of the traditional subject matter into an area demanding deeper techniques. During the later part of the 19th century, the detailed study of projective geometry became less fashionable, although the literature is voluminous. Some important work was done in enumerative geometry in particular, by Schubert, that is now considered as anticipating the theory of churn classes, taken as representing the algebraic topology of Grassmannians. Paul Dirac studied projective geometry and used it as a basis for developing his concepts of quantum mechanics. Although his published results were always in algebraic form, see a blog article referring to an article in a book on this subject, also to a talk Dirac gave to a general audience during 1972 in Boston about projective geometry, without specifics as to its application in his physics. Description 
Projective geometry is less restrictive than either Euclidean geometry or affine geometry. It is an intrinsically non-metrical geometry, whose facts are independent of any metric structure. Under the projective transformations, the incidence structure and the relation of projective harmonic conjugates are preserved. A projective range is the one-dimensional foundation. Projective geometry formalizes one of the central principles of perspective art, that parallel lines meet at infinity, and therefore are drawn that way. In essence, a projective geometry may be thought of as an extension of Euclidean geometry in which the direction of each line is subsumed within the line as an extra point and in which a horizon of directions corresponding to coplanar lines is regarded as a line. Thus, two parallel lines meet on a horizon line in virtue of their possessing the same direction. Idealized directions are referred to as points at infinity, while idealized horizons are referred to as lines at infinity. In turn, all these lines lie in the plane at infinity. However, infinity is a metric concept, so a purely projective geometry does not single out any points, lines or plane in this regard, those at infinity are treated just like any others, because a Euclidean geometry is contained within a projective geometry, with projective geometry having a simpler foundation. General results in Euclidean geometry may be derived in a more transparent manner, where separate but similar theorems of Euclidean geometry may be handled collectively within the framework of projective geometry. For example, parallel and non-parallel lines need not be treated as separate cases. We single out some arbitrary projective plane as the ideal plane and locate it at infinity using homogeneous coordinates. Additional properties of fundamental importance include this argues theorem and the theorem of Pappus. In projective spaces of dimension 3 or greater there is a construction that allows one to prove Disargue's theorem, but for dimension 2, it must be separately postulated. Using Disargue's theorem, combined with the other axioms, it is possible to define the basic operations of arithmetic, geometrically. The resulting operations satisfy the axioms of a field, except that the commutativity of multiplication requires Pappus's hexagon theorem. As a result, the points of each line are in one-to-one -one correspondence with a given field F, supplemented by an additional element infinity, such that R infinity equals infinity, minus infinity equals infinity, R plus infinity equals infinity, R zero equals infinity, R infinity equals zero, infinity minus R equals R minus infinity equals infinity. However, zero zeroths, infinity, infinity, infinity plus infinity, infinity minus infinity, zero infinity and infinity zero remain undefined. Projective geometry also includes a full theory of conic sections, a subject already very well developed in Euclidean geometry. There are advantages in being able to think of a hyperbola in an ellipse is distinguished only by the way the hyperbola lies across the line at infinity, and that a parabola is distinguished only by being tangent to the same line. The whole family of circles can be considered as conics passing through two given points on the line at infinity, at the cost of requiring complex coordinates. Since coordinates are not synthetic, one replaces them by fixing a line and two points on it, and considering the linear system of all conics passing through those points as the basic object of study. This method proved very attractive to talented geometers, and the topic was studied thoroughly. An example of this method is the multi-volume treatise by H. F. Baker. There are many projective geometries, which may be divided into discrete and continuous. A discrete geometry comprises a set of points, which may or may not be finite in number, while a continuous geometry has infinitely many points with no gaps in between. The only projective geometry of dimension zero is a single point. A projective geometry of dimension one consists of a single line containing at least three points. 
The geometric construction of arithmetic operations cannot be performed in either of these cases. For dimension 2, there is a rich structure in virtue of the absence of Disargues' theorem. According to Greenberg and others, the simplest two-dimensional projective geometry is the Fano plane, which has three points on every line, with seven points and seven lines in all, having the following collinearities, A, B, C, A, D, A, F, G, B, D, G, B, E, F. CDF, CEG, with homogeneous coordinates A equals, B equals, C equals, D equals, E equals, F equals, G equals, or, in affine coordinates, A equals, B equals, C equals, D equals, E equals, F equals and G equals. The affine coordinates in a de Sargassian plane for the points designated to be the points of infinity can be defined in several other ways. In standard notation, a finite projective geometry is written pg where a is the projective dimension, and b is one less than the number of points on a line. Thus, the example having only seven points is written pg. The term projective geometry is used sometimes to indicate the generalized underlying abstract geometry, and sometimes to indicate a particular geometry of wide interest such as the metric geometry of flat space which we analyze through the use of homogeneous coordinates, and in which Euclidean geometry may be embedded. The fundamental property that singles out all projective geometries is the elliptic incidence property that any two distinct lines L and M in the projective plane intersect at exactly one point P. The special case in analytic geometry of parallel lines is subsumed in the smoother form of a line at infinity on which P lies. The line at infinity is thus a line like any other in the theory. It is in no way special or distinguished. The parallel properties of elliptic, Euclidean and hyperbolic geometries contrast as follows. The parallel property of elliptic geometry is the key idea that leads to the principle of projective duality. Possibly the most important property that all projective geometries have in common, duality. In 1825, Joseph Gergon noted the principle of duality characterizing projective plane geometry. Given any theorem or definition of that geometry, substituting point for line, lie on for pass through, collinear for concurrent, intersection for join, or vice versa, results in another theorem or valid definition, the dual of the first. Similarly in three dimensions, the duality relation holds between points and planes, allowing any theorem to be transformed by swapping point and plane, is contained by and contains. More generally, for projective spaces of dimension n, there is a duality between the subspaces of dimension r and dimension n minus r minus 1. For n equals 2, this specializes to the most commonly known form of duality, that between points and lines. The duality principle was also discovered independently by Jean-Victor Poncelet. To establish duality only requires establishing theorems which are the dual versions of the axioms for the dimension in question. Thus, for three-dimensional spaces, one needs to show that every point lies in three distinct planes. Every two planes intersect in a unique line and a dual version of to the effect. If the intersection of plane P and Q is coplanar with the intersection of plane R and S, then so are the respective intersections of planes P and R, Q and S. In practice, the principle of duality allows us to set up a dual correspondence between two geometric constructions. The most famous of these is the polarity or reciprocity of two figures in a conic curve or a quadric surface. A commonplace example is found in the reciprocation of a symmetrical polyhedron in a concentric sphere to obtain the dual polyhedron. 